Last week, we looked at uh, verses 10 through 12, so we're going to skip down uh, today to verse 14 as Jesus then interprets the parable for those who have asked him about it. He says, The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear Satan, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. They have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfaithful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. You can be seated. As we uh, began looking at chapter 4 last week, I pointed out that in this chapter, Mark actually records four parables that Jesus taught. And we looked at that section in verses uh, 10 through 12 last week, where Jesus explains the reason why he taught in parables. This week, then, we're going to look at the first parable, which is also the longest in this section, and perhaps the most well-known, at least one of the most well-known, of all of the parables that Jesus taught, and we're pretty familiar with it. For the most part, though, when we think about this parable, we tend to focus on the different kinds of soil that Jesus describes in his interpretation. And those different kinds of soil affect whether and how the word of God takes root and bears fruit in people's lives. And certainly, that's an important thing. That's, uh, Jesus made that pretty clear as he talked about what the different soils meant. But like most of Jesus' parables, this is also a parable about the kingdom, the kingdom of God and what God is doing. And so I want to start there today. I want to consider for a few moments what this parable has to say to us about the kingdom. As we've been noticing over the past number of weeks, Jesus' message declaring the arrival of the kingdom, remember that he he went around Galilee saying the time is fulfilled, The words of the prophets have been realized. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven has come. And why has the kingdom of heaven come? Because I have come, right? But that message, declaring the arrival of the kingdom, was not received with approval by everyone. Not everyone was excited about it. In fact, those that we would have thought would be most excited by the arrival of the Messiah, the religious leaders were the least impressed, and they had already drawn the conclusion that Jesus must be acting in the power of Satan. And even Jesus' own family had concerns about him. And we can even look at the crowds, and with the benefit of hindsight, we know that uh, the crowds weren't actually there because they necessarily believed in him. There were lots of people that were following him, but in the end, they were more interested in his miracles than in his message. And ultimately, most of them abandoned him. The biggest reason for that, as I've mentioned several times, is failed expectations. They expected the arrival of the Messiah to be something that wouldn't be able to be missed. That would change 
the whole world and would result ultimately in a worldwide government centered in Jerusalem. Remember when even the disciples themselves had that expectation when they they said, you know, when, we co- when you come into your kingdom, when, when they asked that question of Jesus, you know, uh, can we sit at your right, one at your right and one at your left, James and John, right? That they weren't thinking in terms of the eternal kingdom someday in the future. They were thinking then Jesus showed up in Jerusalem and took his throne. And so they were expecting someone to do that, and they were expecting the Messiah to be a champion of the law of Moses. But Jesus and his ministry didn't look anything like that. And so they had a lot of questions. If the kingdom had come, as Jesus was saying it had, then why hadn't it come with the big bang we expected it to come with? And why did Jesus seem to be so careless where the law of Moses was concerned? And why did he refuse to take the power that he needed to have to make this thing happen? And why was he telling them to love their enemies instead of rallying them against their enemies? So Jesus told this parable, along with the other parables that Mark records for us in chapter 4, to address those questions and to help those with ears to hear, to help them better understand what God was doing and why it didn't seem as impressive as they thought it should be. So to illustrate his point, he used an example that his audience would have been very familiar with. And they would have understood as a simple fact of everyday life. He told the story of a man sowing seed. And that brought to their minds the picture of a farmer working in a typical first century Palestinian field. And uh, that would have been a, a, a really good illustration that most everybody would have understand because especially in Galilee, most people were very connected uh, to the land and connected to the practices of farming. But fields in the first century didn't look a lot like the fields that we picture today. Uh, We have fields with huge amounts of land and perfectly straight rows that uh, are basically vast expanses of crops that are weed-free, right? I can remember when I went out west uh, and uh, signed on with a grain harvesting crew back in my college days. Uh, We could have three guys with big combines that could cut 30 feet at a time Uh, cutting until lunch, and we would just get through one field. Those were big fields. But the fields that Jesus' audience would have pictured were pretty small, and they were pretty rough. For one thing, they didn't have modern machinery. Most fields had to be plowed by hand. That is, by the person himself pulling the plow. If uh, there were... Uh, if, if you were fortunate enough to have enough money to afford an ox or a mule, um, you could use that, but it was still grueling work. And so fields were by necessity, small patches of ground. How much can you, how long can you drag a plow for, after all? And they didn't have the benefit of modern pesticides like we do, and the soil. Um, and this is part of the illustration, the soil in Palestine is, is much thinner than the deep, rich soil that we're used to in the Midwest. There's an underlying layer of rock in many places in Palestine, and you can't see it because it's just below the surface, but wherever the rock comes close to the surface, the soil is thinner. And so it's, it's much less able to nurture the plants that are planted in it. So you could actually look at a field 
in midsummer and know where the rocks were, even though they were beneath the surface, because there would be patches of withered crops where the rocks came close to the surface. And all of those were challenges that were faced by first century farmers, which everyone took for granted as a normal part of everyday life. They were used to losing precious seed to the birds because it landed on the hard-packed paths that crisscrossed all those little fields. And they were used to what looked like lush green fields in early spring where the sun warmed that shallow soil first and the rain cultivated those seedlings. Um, They were used to those patches giving way to dry, withered crops. And they were used to the constant battle with weeds. So they were familiar with the obstacles and the challenges that could prevent much of that precious seed from producing a harvest. But they also knew that even though much of the seed would be lost, the seed that did take root and flourish would ultimately produce a harvest many times what was sown. So it is with the kingdom of God. The fact that Jesus and his message had encountered obstacles and opposition and his announcement of the kingdom was rejected by many was not evidence that the kingdom had not actually come. And that's the point that Jesus is making. The problem, after all, was not with the seed, and any farmer understood that. The problem was not with Jesus and his message. The problem was with the soil on which the seed fell. Human hearts, which weren't ready to receive him. In Jesus, the kingdom of God had indeed broken into the world. And though at that moment it may look, and at this moment it still looks like a scrawny, weedy, patchy field. In the end, though, the value of the kingdom and the success of the kingdom needs to be judged not by how it looks today, but by the harvest that is yet to come. Think about that. Think about the harvest of the kingdom. It reminds me of what John describes for us in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, where he says, that, and he's describing the harvest He says, I saw a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and from all tribes and languages standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb clothed in white robes. That is the harvest. So Jesus said in verse 9, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Learn from what you know and already know to be true in your everyday life. Don't be deceived by appearances. Don't be discouraged by the obstacles. Don't let the fact that many have rejected me and my message lead you to the conclusion that there is nothing of value in what I have to say. God is at work. Do you believe that? His kingdom has been established in this world. And even now, an abundant harvest is growing in the field. In spite of the birds, in spite of the rocks, in spite of the weeds. The problem is not with the message or the messenger, 
but with the condition of the hearts of those to whom the message and the messenger have come. And that leads us then to Jesus' explanation in verses 14 through 20 of the different kinds of soil on which the seed falls, which is really a description of people's hearts, isn't it? The first is the hard-packed earth of the pathways through the fields, which, of course, describes those whose hearts are hardened toward God, so much so that the message of the gospel just bounces off of their hearts, and it fails to penetrate even beneath the surface. In Jesus' day, Those folks were the religious leaders for the most part, right? Not all of them, but in general, the Gospels characterized those who had the authority um, and who, who, who were the authorities on the word of God and the prophets and the law and everything else. They were the ones who had already made judgments about what the Messiah should look like, and Jesus didn't fit the bill, and so they were closed. They didn't give his message of fair hearing, because they had already made their, up their minds. I find that to be one of the unique challenges of living in a post-Christian culture. I spend time, as you know, interacting with um, people from Asia in our ESL program and really people from around the world, many of whom come from cultures where Um, they really have never heard the gospel, and they know they haven't heard the gospel. And so we can communicate it to them in a way that is new, that that is something new that they haven't heard before. But for most people in our culture who uh, grew up in what seemed to be a Christian culture, they kind of come from the position of, well, uh, you know, been there, done that. I've, I've heard the gospel, and, it's, and I already know it's not for me. But the fact is, they never have heard the gospel. They haven't a clue what it is. They're only basing their decisions on vague impressions. And of course, what that does for us is it challenges us that we need to continue to sow that seed in spite of the fact that those hearts are hard, so that they do in fact hear a true telling of the gospel. There are a lot of others in our culture who believe in a God of their own making. Um, We hear that all the time. My God, any God worth his salt, according to me, a God that I can believe in, wouldn't do this or that, or wouldn't be like this or that. And so who's leading the way here? Is it the eternal creator saying, I am God and and, uh, I need you to accept who I am? Or is it us saying to God, hey, God, you better catch up with the times. The second kind of soil is that shallow soil where the underlying rock comes close to the surface. And then the soil is thin there, so the sun warms it quickly. And it's often the seed in that thin soil that flourishes first and grows up first. But the rocks beneath the surface prevent the roots from getting down. And when the sun beats down, they wither and die. Jesus says this soil represents those who are not able to persevere through tribulation and persecution. Essentially, it represents folks who expect following Jesus to be easy. And they're drawn to him by the prospect of what he can do for them. And we find in the Gospels that the crowds, many of them were there for that reason. They thought, well, He's a healer. Maybe he can heal me. Or, man, he fed all those people on the mountain a few weeks ago. I'm going to go see if he's going to do it again. But following Jesus is not always easy. 
in the scorching sun of adversity tests the soil of our hearts. And it reveals for us how deep our roots really are. Because there will be times when our expectations of God are disappointed. And there are times that we probably all go through. I certainly know that I have. There are times when it doesn't seem as though God is acting in love or acting for our good. I can remember uh, when Lyle was about three, we had uh, moved back to this area after being in seminary, and he was born in Chicago while I was at seminary. And uh, um, I ended up coming back before seminary was finished and uh, um, decided I needed to turn back to carpentry to keep our family alive. But it was in the midst of a recession, and I couldn't find a job in carpentry. I remember one day coming out to Sharon after scouring the newspaper, which uh, uh, we did back then, right? We didn't go to uh, the LinkedIn or all that other stuff. And uh, the, 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 the best prospect for work I could find was to be a sausage stuffer. <laughs> and I came out to Sharon and said, well, it looks like, you know, that's what it's going to be, from seminary to a sausage stuffer. And then our car died, and it was like the straw that broke the camel's back. And I can remember kneeling down on the floor of our bedroom, pounding the floor, saying, God, what are you doing? I, am, I have spent this time and energy preparing to serve you. And this is what I get out of it? We face those kinds of times. I can look back and see all that God was doing in that. I couldn't see it at the time. There may be times when our faith in him is actually the cause of our suffering. Because we face the hatred and the contempt of a world that hates him and has contempt for him. And there will be much that we hold dear that we must lay down along the way of discipleship, perhaps even our own lives. And those whose roots are not deep enough to persevere in faith through the troubles and the persecution that always come with following Jesus. Those who aren't able are like seed that falls on shallow, rocky soil. The adversity we face reveals our hearts, doesn't it? How deep the soil is, how deep those roots go. The third soil is infested with weeds and thorns. It represents those who begin to follow Jesus, but ultimately succumb to the worries and the cares of this world and to the deceitfulness of wealth. And Jesus says, desires for other things. I would suggest this challenge to faith is more subtle, and that's why Jesus calls it deceitful. It describes those, and I think we all kind of fall into this category to some degree or another, describes those who want to take hold of the kingdom of God without necessarily letting go of the promises and the pleasures this world offers. And often... Those are good things. We saw a few weeks ago that one of those good things is family. And that, in fact, there are times when being kingdom people requires us to decidedly turn away from our family. Success, financial security, the enjoyment of life. That's why Jesus says they're deceitful, because they don't look destructive on the surface. 
But the temporal pleasures and the fulfillment that this world offers to us cannot feed our souls. And that is the problem. Because if we try to draw our life from them, they will ultimately choke out the life of God in us. And we allow the roots of our lives to get entangled with the roots of the things of this world, and they choke us out. It's kind of like weeds. The problem with weeds is you're never done with weeds. They're always coming back. And we are always faced with that need to weed the soil of our lives and to pull out those things that may seem like innocent little seedlings at the moment, but tomorrow you wake up and they're a great tree. I think a lot of people struggle with that because they perceive that the Christian life is about giving up all the good things in life for a life of somber self-denial. And that's, I think, how they often interpret the, the, the Jesus encounter with the rich young ruler. If you want to follow me, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. But the danger that Jesus is talking about here, and I think it's important for us to understand it, the danger is not in having things or enjoying life. If God has blessed you with financial prosperity, if he's blessed you with a loving family, and he's blessed you with success, be a good steward of those blessings that God has given you and enjoy those blessings. But beware the danger they also pose. Have you found that the more stuff you have, the more you have to worry about? (laughs) And the more you have to lose, the harder it is to imagine giving it up? That was the problem of the rich young ruler. His problem was not that he was wealthy. His problem was that he had sunk the roots of his life into his wealth and become so entangled that he was unable to disentangle himself from the weeds and the thistles to follow Jesus. And again, Jesus' request revealed the condition of his heart. You cannot serve two masters, Jesus says. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18, he says this. He said us, says, let us look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary. Have you ever thought about that? I think about that with some frequency because as you know, I like to build things. (laughs) But I always remember that the things that I build are someday just going to be piles of rotten wood. The things that are unseen are eternal. Seek first, Jesus says, the kingdom of God. And he will provide your life and everything else you need. Finally, Jesus speaks of the fertile soil that produces fruit in abundance. Far more than what was sown at first. And that soil, of course, represents those who respond to Jesus with sincere hearts and truly surrender their lives to him. And when they do, he can produce in us and through us an abundant harvest. So listen to these just 
a few of the many passages about fruit that we find in Scripture. Psalm chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Blessed are those whose delight is in the Lord, who meditate on his law day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, who yield their fruit in season, and whose leaves do not wither. Fertile soil. Matthew 12 and verse 33, Jesus says, A tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If it is bad, its fruit will be bad. In John 15 and verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And then he goes on in verse 8 to say, And when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples, and this brings great joy to my Father. Just a couple of points of application. First, we can be greatly encouraged in spite of outward appearances because the seeds of the kingdom are being sown in the world. Though not all of them are falling on good soil, and sometimes it looks as though All there is is a scrawny patch, and we wonder how can the gospel survive? Do you ever wonder that when you look around the world today? How can the church survive? How can the gospel survive? Don't lose heart. A great harvest is coming and is even now growing in the field. And no obstacle And no challenge can prevent it from bearing its fruit. Secondly, it's a call to examine ourselves soberly and realistically. As Jesus says, it's a call for us to have ears to hear. Those who assume that this parable has nothing to say to them are those who are in most danger. And that's exactly why Jesus said that. So it's a challenge for us to take inventory of our lives and to ask ourselves, have we truly counted the cost of discipleship? Are we willing to follow him wherever he leads And are we willing to follow him through whatever he leads us through so that whatever it is, we will come out on the other end still following and not having abandoned the course? And like the weeds that keep coming back, it's a call for us to remain vigilant, to tend the soil of our hearts. And to ask ourselves, have we allowed dependence on temporal things, things that won't last? Have we allowed our dependence on those things to grow so that we're drawing our life from them instead of from God? That's not the kind of thing you wake up in the morning and decide to do, right? You don't wake up and say, I think I'm going to just abandon God today. something that happens subtly over time as we give ground and as we hold on. It's a constant battle. We sing in that, that song today, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart 
Take and seal it. Consecrate it. Set it aside for you alone. Finally, we too are sowers. We have also been called to be sowers of the message of the kingdom. And the fact is, we don't have any control over what kind of soil that seed falls on. Don't get discouraged and don't be surprised when the seed you sow falls on hard hearts and doesn't seem on the outside to produce any response to the gospel. Our responsibility is to bear witness. It's God's responsibility to wake the dead, to open blind eyes, and to produce the harvest. This is an important season in our life as a congregation. We are about to embark on an extensive remodeling project And we've committed ourselves to reach out to our community because we believe there's something happening here that is worth sharing with the community of faith and with those who don't know Christ. But I think it's important for us as we do that that we ask ourselves, why are we doing it? And we not stop asking ourselves, that we keep pulling the weeds. Are we spending our wealth on ourselves? Are we just building a church? I think about that as I think about retirement in a few years. And um, um, what is the legacy that I'm really aiming at? I want godly men and women who love the Lord and are seeking him. And I need to remind myself of that because it's tempting to want numbers. It's tempting to want to leave this place beautiful and thriving according to earthly standards. What do we want? What are we aiming for? Are we committed to kingdom work? The fact is that only the fruit that is ultimately produced will reveal where our hearts truly are in all of this. So let us keep our eyes on Jesus. Let us draw our life from him and him alone. That indeed a harvest of souls might be produced as we remain faithful And sow the seed of the gospel. Believing and trusting that one day we, along with the multitudes from around the earth, will gather around the throne of God to sing, Worthy is the Lamb. Let us keep that in our vision. This sanctuary is going to fall apart someday. We are called to a different sanctuary. Let us keep our eyes on that day. Amen. Grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm going to miss you for a few weeks, but I look forward to being back together with you again soon. God bless you as you go. Amen.